All right, y'all, it's Barry. I'm here to talk today about work and energy. I can get you a quick summary for that. As you know, we'll do it in about 10 slides, so I'm just gonna get to it so we can get rolling. First, we need to define work. Work is defined as a force being applied to an object that moves it then some distance, okay? W is gonna be our work and force in Newtons times meters because F is force in Newtons and D is distance in meters. And so we have someone here applying a force in Newtons that's moving this object some distance here s in meters, and we see that that's how this is all going to work out. It's our basic definition for work in physics. Note also that newtons times meters down here um, are going to be equivalent to joules. That's going to be really important when we start looking at energy, which we'll do in just a second. Now, we do need to make sure that we have work in a specific direction. And so the force and the direction must be in the same vector plane. So a quick summary here so that we can tell what's what. If we have a direction of a force and a direction of motion, we are doing work. They are in the same direction. We've got that covered there. If we pick up a backpack or we are applying a force upwards to hold a backpack while moving in a different direction, we are not doing work because they are not in the same vector plane. If we are picking a bag of groceries up off the ground, then the direction that we are applying a force and the direction of motion are the same, so we are doing work. And here in the case of holding the groceries, we are applying a force upwards, but moving, I'm sorry, carrying the groceries, we are applying a force upwards, but moving to the side, so we are not doing work there either. Another important note, if the force that's being applied is at some angle, we need to use the component of that force that is in the direction of motion in order to find the work done. So you'll have to use your trig to get that done there. All right, positive and negative work. So when we're looking at this, we need to think about the ways that these match up to determine whether this value is going to be a positive or a negative with how we're looking at it. So we have a guy here doing a bench press and his elbows are bent at a really weird angle, but whatever, who knows what's going on there. Um, but to look real quick, so if the force is in the direction of motion, they're both applied together in the same direction, that'd be positive work. If the force is applied, let's say, upwards, but the motion is actually downwards, we would have negative work and a reminder that they have to be in the same direction or there is no work done. So if it's at 90 degrees, they're not in the same direction, they're in different planar fields, so it's going to be no work. And if the object is not moving, then there's no distance, so there's going to be no work done there either. So we're going to look real quick at a couple examples right here. Um, and see exactly how it is that this is working. So if the barbell is moving down, he has this right here. He's got the barbell moving down. He is applying a force in the positive direction, but the distance that it's moving is in the negative direction. So we're actually going to have negative work done by the person. Now, we'll talk about frame of reference in a minute. This could actually be considered positive work done by gravity, but we'll get to that in a minute. So by the person here who's doing the bench press, force, he's pushing up to make sure it doesn't fall on him. The distance is moving downwards, so the work is negative. Now, in the sense that he hits his chest with it and starts moving it back up, still applying a positive upward force, but now we have a positive displacement. The distance that it's moving is upwards, so we're actually going to have positive work in that scenario. Okay? Okay. All right, so to move on here to power. Power is the rate at which work is accomplished. And when we say rate at which, this is something that got covered in kinematics, right? Velocity is the rate at which we change our uh, displacement or our position. And so that just means we're going to divide by time. That's really what it comes down to. We're dividing by time. So power is going to be work divided by time. And a reminder that work is force times distance. So we could find power by taking the force applied times the distance that an object moves and dividing by the time that it's completed in. T time is going to be measured in seconds, and we already covered the units for the other ones. Power will be measured in watts. Okay, another uh, unit for this is horsepower, but you should see watts in most locations. So we've got a force being applied here of 12 newtons. An object moves five meters, and you see this was a gif, but uh, doesn't work in this... Uh, setup. So uh, it, it moves to three seconds, and I just took the screenshots of each, and we could then determine with five meter distance being applied or being traveled, a 12 newton force being applied, and three seconds having passed what the power would be in watts. Moving on from there, we need to look at kinetic energy. So we're going to get into our energies now. Kinetic energy is defined as the energy of an object due to motion, okay? Um, and so it's really important to note here just what our quick equation is. Kinetic energy, okay, again, one half m mass kilograms, velocity, v squared, excuse me, velocity, meters per second. It's going to give us kinetic energy in joules. Now, work that goes into a system can cause a change in the kinetic energy of the system or a change really in the overall energy of a system. But in the case here of what we're looking at mechanical energy for this unit, it's going to probably cause a change in the kinetic energy of the system. So this person here 
has a force that's being applied, this push force, times some distance, that's the input, that's the work input. This object then has an output that would be measured in kinetic energy. So if this box is the system, then we are putting work into it with this push, this person is putting work into it, and we would see the output with the mass and the velocity. We could calculate that output as one half mv squared, and this would then be equal to the force applied times the distance that it moves. So we could actually say the work going into this system would result in kinetic energy coming into the system and thus moving it, okay? Now, this is, again, why we say the Newton meter is equivalent to joules, because the input of Newton meters makes joules go into this system that we're looking at. Right. Now, gravitational potential energy. This is really just the ability to fall is what it comes down to. Okay, So gravitational potential energy here, um, stored in an object due to its position above the Earth's surface. So EP, and you're going to see potentially, huh, get it, um, the potential energy shown in many different ways, E sub P, P, E. Um, you might see it just as a capital U. They all mean the same thing. Um, it's going to be the mass times the gravitational acceleration um, that we have here due to Earth and the height above that, that it could fall to. OK, now that's really important. Um, and we'll talk again about frame of references here in just a minute. OK, so this mass has the potential to roll down the hill and that potential energy would change into a different type of energy as it goes down. We'll talk about conservation in a minute, too, but it can only roll to the bottom of the hill. And that's important to note. The taller the hill, the further it can roll. So that H is very important here. All right, it's time to look at frame of reference, and I've said this a couple times, but I want to look at these shelves first. We're going to talk right away about the gravitational potential energy. This cup that's up here is close to this edge of the shelf. It could have a couple different things happen on this shelf specifically, right? It could fall off to the left here, and then it could fall down to this position. And so we would have a height here that we could measure and determine the gravitational potential energy of this object. But if this cup were to fall off this side, it could fall much further, okay? And so our frame of reference is different there because the height will have increased and it has greater gravitational potential on this side than it does on this side because our frame of reference is different, okay? Now this object here could fall to there. So if we said these two had the same mass, Right now, based on where they are towards the center, the cup up here on top would have a greater gravitational potential than this fake tree or whatever this thing is, okay? And then anything falling off to the outside could fall all the way down. But again, this would be greater height than this, than this, okay? Now, to look at these systems and see maybe how work is done, what we've got right here is a person dropping a ball off of some structure while they're somewhere on the, on the earth. OK, maybe not all the way at the North Pole here, but right, you understand what I'm going for here. So they drop at some height, it falls, and we could uh, determine here an energy transfer as this happens. And that will be due to the position, due to that height above the Earth. If we look at just this system and we do not include the Earth, well, then the source of a force that's causing this to move downwards, the gravitational force, is outside of the system. So in this case, we couldn't just say that there's a transfer of energy within the system because the Earth is not within the system in this case. We would say that gravity is actually applying a force, the force of gravity, the weight, to this object that will do work on it and cause it to move downwards then. Now, what's really important here is right here we could say a transfer of energy. We would say that that PE here equals MGH. Now, over here, if we said, okay, this is work done by gravity. Well, work is force times distance. The distance is going to be the height. And the force is going to be the force of gravity that we measure as mg. So note, while we're looking at a different frame of reference, we would still determine the number of joules this object would have the same way. mgh, mgh. OK, so we can look at energy transfer in this way or work done by gravity in this way. Either way, we're going to determine it the same way and the values will end up being the same. All right. Conservation of energy. This is our last topic here. So 
If we expand our equation for mechanical energy and look at conservation, we're going to have the total kinetic initially and the total potential initially. That's going to stay constant. The total of those, the energy going into the system, is going to equal the energy at the final position in the system or at any position throughout the system, assuming no losses. So we're assuming no friction, no heat loss, no anything like that. Okay. So if you look right here, here's a great example of a total of 50,000 joules throughout a system as someone moves through the system. So we've got what looks like a skier here doing some sort of jump. We've got 50,000 joules of potential at the top because they haven't started moving yet. As they go down, some of that 50 goes from the potential to kinetic, and that continues until here, and then they start going up again. And so some of the kinetic then turns back to potential, and again, we have just kinetic down at the end. And if you look, it's 50,000 joules at every single location. Now, what's important here also is to keep in mind our frame of reference. OK, um, well, and I want to do that note right there, right? If it's still at the top, then the potential energy transfers to Ke at the bottom and we see the full transfer. And you're going to see that in most cases here. Total kinetic at the top being zero, total potential at the top being the max, total kinetic at the bottom being the max and total potential at the bottom being zero. Right? Now, in the case of this roller coaster over here, this red line is really important because you see this roller coaster is built on some sort of stilts or some sort of pyres or something that's holding it up above the ground. We would still say this red line here is a position of zero. That height would be zero, and we would measure up from that because that's the lowest position in the roller coaster, even though it's not the ground. So our frame of reference is still going to be very important. So what I've got next here is a couple spots where I want to give people a chance to try a couple of these real quick um, and work a little bit of this out, and then we'll go to the key on the next page. So first, we have a skater here who's coming in with some total mechanical energy that's going to be all kinetic, and as he goes up this little ramp, all of that changes to gravitational potential energy up here, so the mechanical energy is going to stay the same and still be 15 total. We'll pause briefly because the kinetic energy will be zero, and then he'll likely start falling back down here, okay? What I want to know is, what is the skater's velocity at position two, okay? Now, over here for this roller coaster, we're starting up here with all gravitational potential up at the top, no kinetic because it's not moving yet, and again, going down, going through the loop, going up over this little curve at the end and to the end. And so what I would like to know right here is, what is the roller coaster's velocity at position four, right here, where it's one meter above the ground? I would like you to pause and give those a quick shot, and then I'll come back and I'll let you know what those results are. All right. So you got a chance to try those out. Real quick, the skater has velocity of 4.1 meters per second. The roller coaster has a velocity that I forgot to write in right there, but it's right down here. It's 7.67 meters per second. Apologies for not putting that in. And you see here the work that was done to ca calculate those values. Gravitational potential energy in the middle point there, get, helping us determine the mass, and then knowing that there's seven joules, helping us determine the velocity. And here I use position one to determine the mass given that it was all gravitational potential at that point. And then I looked at the total of each there for position two and plugged in my numbers there for position two. So to remove that circle so that you can see it a little bit better, I've got my potential total for position two and my kinetic total for position, excuse me, potential total for position four, kinetic total for position four, and thus a velocity. And I hope this was helpful. Thanks for being here.